The title of the book is Seven Events That Made America, America. It is not the seven most important things in American history, but it's rather uh, seven periods or events that I thought were critical to understanding the character of America and what has really made us into the, the people we are. I thought the first chapter, which is, uh, I thought, somewhat boring, it's the history of how the two political parties came into being and um, under Martin Van Buren's system. And that was the one that seemed to provoke the most interest uh, of all. I kind of thought Eisenhower's heart attack would probably be the most interesting of the chapters. Why did it invoke most of the interest? Martin Van Buren creates something called the spoil system in order to protect slavery. He creates a whole new political party. He calls it the Democratic Party. And the goal is to keep people from talking about slavery at all. And the way you're going to do that is by rewarding them with jobs, jobs in the party, jobs in the state government, jobs in the federal government, but all you have to do is shh, quiet about slavery. You don't talk about slavery. And it works for a while. It works for almost um, 40 years. Um, but it also contains the seeds of its own destruction because for Van Buren's idea to work, the central government, the federal government has to stay small. The states have to remain powerful. That's number one. Second, the federal government, in terms of the presidency, has to be under the control of, of what I call, and it's another historian is calling this, a, a northern man of southern principles. That people understand that by the 1820s, you're not going to be electing slaveholders from the deep south as president. But it's going to be very hard to elect abolitionists from the northeast as president. So you have to have northern men who appear to be moderate, and they're going to leave slavery alone but they're from the North, so Northerners are comfortable voting for them and slaveholders are comfortable voting for them. The Dred Scott de decision is always treated as a decision about slavery, which it was, and that's its primary cause. What I wanted to do in the chapter was to show that, first of all, it was the Panic of 1857 is a direct result of the Scott decision. What happens is that all the railroads that are being built across Nebraska, Kansas, all out in the territories, are being built under the notion of popular sovereignty, which went into the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That is, the people will choose whether it's free or slave. Dred Scott totally undermines that, throws it, completely overthrows the Missouri Compromise. And what businessmen saw was, we're going to get bloody Kansas. We're going to get John Browns running around killing slave owners. We're going to get pro-slave guys burning down free towns. It's going to be chaos, it's going to be bloodshed, and that's not good for business. I tell my students, think about building a, a brand new business in Lebanon, downtown Beirut. You know, it's not someplace people think of to build a business. And so the result of that was that the railroad bonds running only east and west crashed. None of the ones going north and south were trouble, but the east-west bonds crashed. That took down the banks with them, which then brings on the Panic of 1857. And as a corollary, because the southern banking system, surprisingly, was very strong. It had branch banks when the north did not. The south is relatively unaffected, and the southerners take the wrong message from that, and they say, you know, cotton is king. Nobody will make war on King Cotton. We can leave the Union without any serious ramifications. Johnstown had this massive flood, wipes out the town, and how do they respond? Do they ask the federal government for aid? No. Do they ask the state of Pennsylvania for aid? No. They tell the state of Pennsylvania, keep the militia out. We don't need them. We'll handle this. They deputize 70 guys with stars made out of soup cans. No looting, no pillaging, and, and supplies were arriving within 24 hours from volunteers. And, and it's remarkable how quickly they rebuilt without any federal support and with very little state support. Same thing happens in Dayton. We have a very big flood in 1913 here in Dayton. Um, NCR, National Cash Register, um, Mr. Patterson's company, he immediately tells his employees, we're not making cash registers, we're making boats. And they build 90 of these small boats to start sailing out throughout all of Dayton, rescuing people from rooftops, delivering supplies. He deputizes his own security force to make sure there's no looting to protect people. And this time, the um, National Guard does arrive a couple of days late, but by that time, once again, the private sector 
and the local community has handled it. And I just think that compared to the dependency mentality that we saw in Katrina, isn't that a much better way to go of self-sufficiency and let's pull together as a community and handle this ourselves? Well, I thought it would be interesting from two points of view. One, we're in our culture in a debate about food and the impact of food, everything from Mayor Bloomberg and his nannyism and trying to control what size drinks we drink to taking trans fats out to salt is bad. I grew up and they were telling us how coffee and bacon were going to kill you. And I don't know, I'm still around. So um, I figured that that would appeal to a lot of people. And also there's kind of a um, nostalgia for the happy days of, of Eisenhower when America was, was this uh, you know, unprecedented world power. Nobody really messed with us. And, and yet it seemed like everything was all quiet and serene. Of course that's not the case. I figured that um, with Ike, the whole notion that meat was bad, that cholesterol is a killer, that this would really uh, resonate with people, especially with Mayor Bloomberg's uh, agenda to eliminate certain types of foods. Was there any particular chapter that you wrote that really um, you learned something? I would say the chapter called A Steel Guitar Rocks the Iron Curtain, which is about how rock music helped bring down communism. Uh, I was able, through a connection uh, with uh, Mark Stein, not the author, but the keyboard player from Vanilla Fudge, to interview all of these rock and rollers, people like Alice Cooper and Billy Joel, for the book. And uh, what I learned from them was, was really amazing about how the structure of rock and roll, the, the musical structure itself, is a structure of liberation. And so if you're in a communist country, you don't even have to know the lyrics to get the message that rock and roll is about freedom. The song is about young people living in the northeast of America. The lives are miserable because the steel factories are closing. But there are countless stories. Um, Billy Joel told me that when he played Russia, um, I said, did they censor you in any way? He says, no. He says, they, they let me play whatever I want. And now realize he's the first American musician to play Russia since Van Cliburn in 1964. So it's quite an honor. He said, they let me play whatever I wanted, but they said, whatever you do, do not have the kids come to the front of the auditorium. They were very much into sitting in their seats, right? And he said that the police did not have firearms, but they had tranquilizer darts and tranquilizer guns. They were afraid the kids would go nuts. So Joel said, you know what I had them do. I said, well, right, you call them down to the front immediately. He goes, yeah, they all came down. The soldiers were throwing their hats in the air. So I thought that was pretty funny. What's the biggest mistake Ronald Reagan made? Reagan's biggest mistake was uh, putting our troops into Lebanon as peacekeepers. I think we've learned that peacekeepers are little more than targets unless, and the research now bears this out, unless there is already a negotiated settlement by both sides and both sides want to keep the peace. But if it's just a matter of a guy standing between two sumo wrestlers trying to do that, it's not going to work. And, and our guys paid the ultimate price. His second greatest mistake was then pulling them out because Osama bin Laden frequently made reference to the two explosions. And he was talking, this is in the 80s and, and early 90s, he was talking about the Marine barracks and the French paratrooper barracks and, and how the West could be bloodied into backing off and giving Al-Qaeda what it wanted. I think Reagan, for all his great strengths, really missed the rise of militant Islam. Um, it's clear he didn't get that, that it was a distinct animal until about 86 or 87. But you do see a shift in Reagan's attitudes after about 86 or 87 when he says, you know, we're dealing with something, this is not just state-powered terrorism to achieve the ends of one state, this is a religious ideology that I'm dealing with. I figured many people would immediately think I was talking about Barry Goldwater. On the right, a somewhat derogatory term for Obama is Barry Sotero, which was his name back in Indonesia. And the whole idea was that uh, after he made his speech, Chris Matthews, 
uh, said, oh, he gave me a chill up my leg. The point of the chapter is that the news media since about 1990 has drifted heavily, heavily, heavily toward the left. And I don't really think that this is too much a matter of debate anymore. Tim Grossclose in his book, The Political Scientist Out of UCLA, uh, statistically proved it. There have been numerous studies um, uh, suggesting this is the case. And, and again, I think there's a danger there. And we've been warned about this uh, by Doris Kearns Goodwin just last week, who said, you know, the New York Times has not done Obama any favors by protecting him. Our system is designed for the media to be an attack dog on all presidents, a watchdog, a guard against excessive government power, and especially presidential power in our term. And I, I think that that has been missing for the last uh, five years and was already, you could see it coming with how they were treating him in the election. If you had to make a chapter number eight, what would it be? It might have to do with addressing how academia has gone so far to the left in all departments except engineering and business. Because that's the question when I make speeches, the, the two questions I get asked the most are, well, why is the media so far to the left? Why, is, why are reporters so far to the left? And I don't have a good answer, and that would be something I think worth researching.